Syria's president, as we've never heard him before, admitting some parts of Syria will have to be neglected so his dwindling army can focus on what he calls more important areas. Is that redrawing the battle lines? And does Bashar al-Assad have the manpower to end the four-year-long civil war? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Nick Clark. So then, Syria's president has given what could be called his most frank assessment of the situation on the ground. Bashar al-Assad saying the type of war that's being fought means the army cannot be everywhere. Our first priority are the critical areas that our military forces have to hang on to. These areas are important either for military, political, economic or logistical purposes. In specific areas where the terrorists have the upper hand, our top priority must be to commit and to retake those areas, otherwise we will lose everything. That is why in such situations we may have to take control of certain areas that may not be known to everyone. And we may have to lose control of some areas that are high profile and well known or are deemed by media as important but are not necessarily important to us. So let's take a look at what Syria looks like now in terms of who's got control of what where. And just bear in mind that within the mapped areas we're about to show you, the battle lines are changing continuously. But as it stands, this is how it looks right now. This is a whole region. And up here on the border with Turkey in this grey area, the Kurdish YPG have taken over the area from the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, a little further east, which includes this swathe of land all the way down to the Iraqi border and beyond. That's all ISIL-held territory. Then you move on to Idlib province, this kind of mustard-coloured area here. Here we have the rebel-held region, multiple opposition groups within that zone. And then the regime-controlled areas all the way down from the coast, all the way through Homs and down to Damascus. And you can also see on the borders with Jordan, Lebanon and Israel down there in the south, uh, there's a rebel-held patch of land which includes Kenetra and Dera. Kenetra is strategic for the rebels because it's considered a gateway to the capital, Damascus. So the regime has been defeated on several fronts, putting it in control of no more than 25% of the country. Does this mean the country is heading towards partition? Not according to the president, Bashar al-Assad. Division cannot be done through geographical parameters because certain areas fall and then they are regained. Division can only be achieved if the people want and seek it. This can only happen if the willingness to live as one is lost and if the Syrian nation is willing to lose its unity. Is this the case? No, this is not the case. Let's review. All the different groups of Syrians are running away from terrorist-run areas and toward government-run areas of the country. Aren't all those Syrians living in the government-run areas living in harmony that existed before the crisis? Some might say this is an exaggeration. Didn't the crisis pull us toward more segregation? This is not true. The language of division and actual action are two different things. What this has done is create an awareness of what division breeds. And people have learned that lesson from this war. At the heart of the lesson is what division does. Uh, President Assad, there, time now for our discussion. Let's bring in our guests uh, from London. I'm joined by Amar Wakaf. He's a Syrian political activist who advocates for Syrian regime reform and not regime change. In Dubai, via Skype, is Ubay Shabanda, a strategic communication, communications director with the Orient Media and a former U.S. Department of Defense analyst. And finally, from Beirut, pleased to say we're joined by Elias Hanna, former Lebanese army general and now lecturer at the American University of Beirut. Gentlemen, welcome all. Uh, Ubay Shabanda, I'd like to start with you first, if I may. Uh, in many ways, it's a surprising speech. Uh, what did you make of it? Absolutely. What we saw here was a very desperate Bashar al-Assad, very unsure of himself. At a time when the wall seems to be closing and his militia forces on the ground are suffering an unprecedented amount of attrition as his forces, his militia forces, 
lose a significant amount of territory to rebel forces in the past year. And we've seen in previous occasions Bashar al-Assad make these triumphalist speeches that his forces will prevail. But here what we saw was that Bashar al-Assad that recognized that his forces are losing significant ground, that many, many of the uh, um, recruits that his militia forces depend upon from Alawite majority areas are now uh, deserting in mass quantities. So we have a wounded regime here that has certainly changed its tone from previous occasions where Bashar al-Assad was assuring uh, the world and the Syrians that he would triumph. But today, what we saw in the uh, previous day was a Bashar al-Assad on much, uh, much weaker footing. Was, and, and you could see it in his body language where he seemed to be unsure of himself. There, seemed, there was a, certainly a quiver in his voice. This wasn't the Bashar al-Assad that we saw a year ago that was absolutely sure that he would defeat rebel forces. So we certainly are seeing a shift in the narrative, in the tone coming from the regime and from Bashar al-Assad himself following a string of embarrassing defeats in the battlefield against rebel forces. Okay, let's bring in Amar Waqif. Yeah, you support uh, regime reform, but not change, as I say. Uh, what did you make of it, uh, as we heard there? A very desperate aside, very unsure of himself. Is that what you think? No, um, absolutely not. I think uh, it was quite surprising yesterday and interesting that uh, out of the subjects that, uh, you know, uh, are on every Syrian's mind, President Assad chose a handful to speak about. He was quite candid. Uh, and that was very interesting, uh, the way I saw it. Unsure of himself, I mean, we've heard this body language uh, thing, analysis, since day one, really, of this crisis. And I'm sure his President Assad is... Uh, progressing and the Syrian government is progressing. I think he yesterday uh, wanted to uh, engage Syrians more with the um, with the state. I think there are a lot of questions uh, that are being asked by Syrians. Why are we losing uh, these sort of battles? Uh, what about you know the issue of division within the country? Everybody's talking about it, and they probably needed a bit of reassurance. But how, how reassuring are the words? Because he was candid about it. How reassuring are the words? Sometimes we are forced to give up areas to move those forces to the areas we want to hold on to. It sounds like he's actually people... he's given up trying to regain parts of the country. I think the manner in which he addressed uh, the subject is far more important than the words he chose. I think because he was candid about it, uh, that reassured people a little bit that, yes, we are facing difficulties, but we know what we are doing and we are in control of our own situation. And with a bit of help, with a bit of uh, unity amongst us, we can actually reach whatever objective we set. Elias Hanna in Beirut, uh, the Syrian government's territorial control stands at no more than 25% of the country of Syria, uh, with the rest divided up amongst disparate groups. How do you read Assad's speech? I think that President Assad is saying the obvious. You know, it's like redrawing a new, a new strategy, that we know that the strategy is like a certain balance between the means and the goals, and he is really confessing that he is lacking the manpower. So now I think that uh, President Assad is really saying, this is my redrawing the priorities of the regime. I will control a certain area and try to do something in the future, but you know, there is a lack of manpower, and I cannot really retake all of this. Why? Because, you know, this is the obvious. I mean, he's saying the obvious. He's declaring that he cannot really retake all of Syria because this mosaic, when you have ISIL, when you have Al-Nusra, when you have Jash al-Fatah, and we have, like, uh, 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 you know, uh, many factions around, he's trying to um, uh, delimit a certain area that stretches from Damascus, and here comes the importance of Zabadani, and then going north into the, maybe around uh, Idlib and uh, 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 the Turkish border. What do you think he's preempting here, uh, Elias? Does he see more defeats to come, do you think? I don't think so, because he's fighting a war of survival. This coastal area and the Damascus, I mean, Damascus is the center of gravity as a political center of gravity. And the coastal area is the, where the people, I mean, the majority, Alawi, are the center of gravity for the population. He will fight as a survival war to contain and control these areas. And maybe he's neglecting the rest 
of Syria saying that I want the Turkish if you want to do something you can do it or in the uh, in, uh, in the eastern uh, area if you want to do something as a coalition you can do whatever and even from the Israeli border and the Turkey I mean the the Jordan border it's like you know uh, no man's land and uh, me as president I will control this area and this is my priorities I will fight for survival for this area it's true to say, isn't it, Amar Waqif, that uh, if he's admitting that he is conceding territory, he's abandoning his own people who live within that territory. Um, no, I don't think he ever, uh, since the very beginning, uh, you know, uh, played the, n the note of let us concede forever. I think the Syrian government in its entirety feel that they are pretty much uh, the legitimate uh, authority all over Syria. They concede that uh, there are quite a few forces that are forcing them to retreat from certain areas, but never will they uh, either... Uh, 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 really abandon areas or even say that they are going to abandon areas. Um, going back to a few points that were raised earlier, I think uh, the likes of Hasake, for example, there are a few Kurds over there that are cooperating with the Syrian army to repel ISIS. Uh, in Aleppo, there are uh, the people of Aleppo, uh, again, cooperating with the Syrian army. So it's not about the coastal area, um, is it? We need to also to remember that the majority of Syrians, two-thirds of those who fled the fight areas uh, went actually into government controlled areas and only one third about four million went to neighboring countries and um, you know despite invitations despite subtle assurances nobody is willing to go uh, to a place where they can't even smoke a cigarette or anything well, I think it's, it's hardly a rousing call to arms is it to say you know we're just going to leave you behind and concentrate on on our own areas here well, in fact, what he tried to say is that this is everyone's war. He tried to put it in a, in a question of to be or not to be sort of style. And then he said, well, where areas where people lend their utmost help to the army, those areas can repel uh, Al-Qaeda-like and ISIS-like, just like what is happening in a few areas that he mentioned and I mentioned earlier. But in areas where people feel a little bit indifferent, then, you know, the army cannot be everywhere and we need to concede. So in a sense, what he's saying, you know, this is everybody's war, this is an existential war, and that everybody needs really to participate. It's not about, you know, let's let the army do it. Uh, everyone needs to participate with their utmost. So it was a call for arms. Yes, indeed. Uh, let's go to our man in Dubai, Ubay Shabanda, who's, uh, who's just desperate to get in, I can see. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we just heard um, from the other guests is absolutely preposterous. This is a look, this is just a regime that is just not in the habit of coming to terms with reality. I mean, we just just recently, Bashar al-Assad gave multiple interviews to Western media outlets where he refused to acknowledge that his air force, that the regime's air force is dropping tons of barrel bombs on top of Syrian civilians on a regular weekly basis. So this is certainly not a regime that really takes care or even cares about the Syrian people as citizens belonging to the state. And this is certainly a, re a regime that has failed to acknowledge the fact that really the, the Syrian state goes beyond Bashar al-Assad and beyond the Assad family. But I just want to tackle you on a point that you said earlier, where you said that uh, Assad looked weak and desperate. But the strange thing is that he did strike a defiant tone nonetheless, saying that defeat does not exist in the dictionary of the Syrian Arab army, didn't he? Again, he's not coming to terms with realities. The reality is that the regime is suffering a manpower shortage, not just because of attrition, because of battlefield losses, but because of desertions. The regime's militia forces draw overwhelmingly from Alawite-majority areas in the country. And we've seen numerous anecdotal evidence, to include in Western media outlets, that Alawite mothers are finding innovative ways to, uh, to send their sons abroad. Military-aged males um, who are Alawite are finding new ways to leave the country, to desert the army. In fact, that's why Bashar al-Assad was forced to um, declare a uh, supposed amnesty for those that have deserted the, uh, the militia forces, the, the majority of which who are Alawite. So this is a regime that is not fighting for all of Syria as we heard from uh, the other guests. All right, let, this let's is a just... regime that's fighting for itself. Let's throw I, that back to, to Amar Waqaf. Yeah, yeah, off you yeah, go. Yeah, I think... 
I think, first of all, uh, describing matters as Alawite this and Sunni that is, is really not telling exactly what is happening in Syria. It's very, you know, it's, it's really on the surface. Going down, down a little bit deeper, let us remember that out of 12 million displaced people, out of 12 million refugees who fled the fighting areas in Syria, eight of those chose to go into government-controlled areas. It's acknowledged, by the way. You know, they're, 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 they're voting with their feet. Look, look, I, I let you speak. Do please you, you refuse, give me some courtesy. Ubai, Ubai, you, know, you can have a program on your own. You, you can, you can Ubai, have a program let's, let's, on your I'll own. I'll come to please. you in a second. Let them ask people are voting. Let, 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 people are voting with their feet. They're going to government controlled areas instead of going to Turkey. I invite your guests uh, uh, to, to invite those people who have fled to Turkey, for example, to Lebanon, to go back to the government, to the non-government controlled areas where all this haven of democracy is happening. It's not really. All Syrians know, whether they're Sunnis, Shiites, Kurds, Arabs, Armenian, whatever it is, that whatever is being drawn here or there about this democracy and freedom uh, sort of fight isn't very much uh, substantiated. We'll buy 30 seconds to respond to that. I want to bring in uh, Elias Hanna again, so you've got 30 seconds to respond to that. Look, the regime is still pursuing a kneel or surrender or starve, starve policy. It is forcing Syrians either to, for, to flee their homes because of their barrel bombs or to accept the dictate of the regime. It is, this is a regime that is on the ground, it is weakened, and one day it will absolutely fall. Okay, Elias, uh, uh, unravel this debate for us, if you would. Uh, where are President Assad's strengths now? What can he look to? I think that President Assad is realizing now what's happening really on the ground. And he is redrawing a new strategy or his grand strategy. He is, I mean, he knows now that he cannot really recover all of Syria. And he knows also that we are in a stalemate between the rebels and this regime. What is heading for, and I called it once like Lebanon plus and Syria minus. Now, according to Hezbollah, or what is Hezbollah doing in Syria, we are seeing like more geography, more places given to the influence of Hezbollah plus the regime. So that's why you are seeing Lebanon, Al Qalamun, and this line M5 that stretches from the capital into uh, 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 Aleppo, this area to the coast, we call it, I call it like Lebanon plus. And the Syria minus, the Syria that you used to know is like this interior of Syria, the eastern side of Syria, like 60 to 65% is lost for the rebels. And he knows very well that this is what he can control today. I mean, there is no replacement for the Alawi in Syria for President Assad. And President Assad knows that the regime I mean, uh, regardless of the personality of his person, that the regime is a must for any political solution in the future. So maybe he's redrawing a new strategy to hold and create a certain balance internally and not going into more territory or okay, terrain okay, losses Elias, or it, major turning point as a loss right, let me ask for the you future. This, let me ask you this then. So if he's uh, redrawing his strategy, if he's trying to uh, reassure his core constituencies, where does that leave him himself and his, his grip on power, if you like? And where does it leave, you know, the map of Syria as it currently stands, the borders of Syria as it currently stands? Are we going to have to redraw it in three years' time? I mean, when you talk about Syria, I mean, there is two situations, the jure situation, which is, you know, the international law, and de facto on the ground, what is for President Assad, he is, you know, the sovereign, the legitimate president that really has to govern all of Syria. But de facto on the ground, he cannot really retake all of Syria. So he's admitting now, he's admitting this reality on the ground as de facto, not as de jure, you know what I mean? And talking about the partition of Syria, Syria will never be partitioned as a partition because it has to be agreed upon by the international system, United Nations Security Council. But de facto on the ground, Syria will be many Syrias in any political solution in the future. All right, uh, Amar, Syria will be many Syrias in the future. 
I don't think so. I think the the refugees who chose to go to government-controlled areas, again, they voted for their fate for a unified Syria. Otherwise, if this schism is really happening, nobody would have dared go into the Druze area or the Alawite area or the Kurds area. But people still believe in a unified Syria, still believe in a state. I wouldn't claim or go even near claiming that everyone who's going into the government-controlled areas is a die-hard supporter for the government. Some of them probably hate the regime and all that stuff, but people, again, are choosing the best option they have, which, something, which is something that they've done since the very beginning. Ubay? When Bashar al-Assad's forces enter an area that has fallen to the rebellion, they, the first thing they do is they send a message, Assad or the country burns. This certainly, the state is beyond the Assad regime. The Assad families always believed that Syria belongs to them. And today we're seeing the state institutions steadily crumbling. There is no Ministry of Defense left. Assad, Bashar al-Assad himself and his inner circle is completely dependent upon Iranian military advisors and Lebanese Hezbollah militia advisors to run the affairs of what's left of his rump state. Certainly we cannot envision, Pandora's box has already been open. People have tasted freedom. They are not going to go back to the dictate of Bashar al-Assad and his regime. What about the state of the army? It has been incredibly weakened, hasn't it? And when uh, President Assad says defeat does not exist in the dictionary of the Syrian Arab army, it's all very well to say that, but how easy is it to, to have the Syrian army at any strength, given the fact that it has been weakened and decimated and, and people are just dodging the draft? I think people are, uh, are uh, a little bit reluctant, and he actually acknowledged that yesterday out of fear. Some families, they've already sacrificed two or three sons and probably a little bit reluctant to send the fourth into battle. So there is a bit of shortage in manpower, but let us remind ourselves that what he was trying to convey yesterday, and which every Syrian knows, is that this is our own battle. If we do not man the government institutions, the state institutions, nobody else will. We cannot bring in uh, you know, parachute in certain uh, soldiers from uh, from around the globe to protect us. We need to do this ourselves. Now, going back to uh, there is no state and uh, this guy is like a family, whatever. Uh, I think one can draw whatever illusions to keep him within a certain zone of comfort. But what is really happening? on the ground is that the Syrian state is still there. They are still paying salaries even in the ISIS-controlled areas for government employees, let alone in other areas as well. And the Syrian state is still the main player inside Syria because it is really even though it is not controlling the entire Syria geographically, but in terms of manpower, it is representative of most of the Syrians because everybody wants the state, you know, to be still there. That's the that's the intention. Let's go to uh, to Ubay one more time. Ubay, um, just just respond to that for us, if you would. Look again, Bashar al-Assad believes that he is the state. Uh, we are seeing increased dependence on Iranian military advisors on the ground. In fact, we just saw a report in the Washington Post that Iranian military officers are directly paying the salaries of Alawite militia fighters that have deserted the uh, so-called Syrian Arab army that no longer exists. So we are seeing that beyond the handful of neighborhoods in central Damascus that are under the nominal control of Bashar al-Assad, that Bashar al-Assad himself isn't even in control of all of the militias that are fighting um, on behalf of his so-called notional state. We are, we are seeing um, an amalgamation of Shia militia forces that have been drawn from far corners of the world, from Afghanistan, from the Hazara, to other places that are fighting under the aegis, not of the state, but under the command and control of Iranian Revolutionary Guard fighters and Lebanese Hezbollah field commanders. And so Bashar al-Assad simply, is simply the puppet here. His speech was an act of desperation, and he was simply not only trying to reassure himself, but to reassure his um, increasingly truncated constituency that they, of, a, of, a, uh, of a delusional uh, perception that victory is around the corner, when in fact it is not. Okay, well, we're running out of time. Just one last question to Elias Hanna. Uh, how do you see this moment in time? Do you think it's a key turning point in the conflict? I don't think so. It's a key turning point. I think maybe it's a message for Iran that he needs more help. Maybe it's the timing of this is like P5 plus one, you know, this the strategic major shift in the region between the United States of America and Iran, and maybe is like uh, justifying the use of uh, foreign militia like Hezbollah, 
and the Asaib Ahl al-Haq within, uh, within Iran. Maybe it's all of this, but I think that for the Syrians uh, in the government control areas, there is no alternative for al-Assad today because, I mean, you cannot really change in the middle of a crisis a president. Maybe he knows in the future the regime will stay and maybe he goes for any political solution in the future. I can see there's a lot more debate and argument left in this discussion, but we have run out of time. Elias Hanna, Amar Wakaf, and Ubay Shabanda, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. And thank you for watching. As ever, always keen to hear from you. Just get in touch via our program page on aljazeera.com or post your comments at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or you can tweet us using at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nick Clark, and the whole team here, it's goodbye. <laughs>